Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I'm going to carry on with this looking at classical works uh, and the openings of them, just to look at the how the, the language and style of it arrests your attention, but not necessarily in the same way. So like we've, we've looked at Jack London, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, and now I'm going to look at Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451, which of course is slightly closer to what I usually talk about, which is fantasy. But the opening of Fahrenheit 451 has a great opening line. It was a pleasure to burn. But in and of itself, that opening line is just sort of floating there. Quite often when we talk about opening lines, when we talk about how good an opening is, the line in and of itself, when we take it out of context and just look at it, it's not actually that impressive. But as soon as we put it in the context, as soon as we have what follows, suddenly it takes on resonance and meaning. And... I think this is the case that we have with Fahrenheit 451. It was a pleasure to burn is a good opening line, but in and of itself, that's where it ended. There's not a lot there. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed with the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world. The blood pounded in his head and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With his symbolic helmet numbered 451 on his solid head and his eyes all orange flame with the thoughts of what came next, he flicked the igniter and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace while the flapping pigeon-winged books died on the porch and lawn of the house, while the books went up in sparkling whirls and blew away on a wind turned dark with burning. This is a fantastic opening to a novel. I think most people are well aware of Fahrenheit 451 and what it's about. But there are a couple of really interesting things that I want to bring up here. And the first thing I'm going to look at is this opening line. It was a pleasure to burn. So what I've done here, I've just changed the one word pleasure. Because quite often we overlook the importance of the word choice that an author uses. And so before I talk about what it was a pleasure to burn is doing in terms of the text, by looking at alternatives, we can see why these different synonyms or different ways to express roughly the same thing. It's always roughly, and there are slightly different connotations. So it was a desire to burn. Desire, pleasure. Pleasure is something that is in enjoyable we can see that with desire but it doesn't quite fit and it feels quite awkward to say it was a desire to burn it was desirous to burn you would want to reorder that sentence it doesn't work it doesn't fit and it's talking about a wanting to burn that's what desire is doing in that sentence rather than it was a pleasure to burn confirming the feeling that you get when you burn things it was a desire to burn is a longing for in this sense unless you change it around it was superb to burn again we're going now for the superlative this is a positive thing pleasure is positive but it was superb to burn you can hear how awkward that is it was exquisite to burn now this is closer i think to what bradbury is doing but again it's not quite a neat fit by the way, I'll have to check, but one of my neighbors has decided to drill things and saw things, and I have no idea if it's coming through in the video, but I'll carry on. It was exquisite to burn. Now, uh, like I said, this is going toward what Bradbury is doing, but exquisite A is um, quite an, an elevated word, and it's 
not quite as earthy as pleasure. Pleasure can be experienced by everyone. But to say something is exquisite, is the epitome of something. It is this positive pinnacle of something. It fits here, but it doesn't have that earthiness, that universality, that connection to the body, that pleasure really comes across. It was great to burn. This is bland. It was a pleasure to burn has something to it, but it was great to burn. Again, it's positive. It's saying that how much um, he enjoys doing it, but it was great to burn. It, again, feels slightly awkward and also doesn't have any of that richness that we get. It was wonderful to burn. This is now going in slightly the wrong direction because wonder as a route for this is not what we're going for here. If we think about pleasure, pleasure being connected to carn um, carnality and the body and warmth and those sorts of things, wonderful is moving towards something that is much sort of lighter and cleaner. Pleasure, there's a, a an earthy darkness, grittiness to it that you don't get from wonderful, which is you know something that's very nice, nice, and that is exacerbated when we think of it was delightful to burn oh isn't that a delight that again it's moved towards this very airy very light very positive very clean imagery and burning is much more carnal much more physical much more rooted in this um dare i say it sexual pleasure that we're about to see in all of these things Wonderful and delightful don't have that connotation. And it was lovely to burn. Oh, isn't it a lovely day? It was lovely to burn. This isn't, again, doesn't have that punch. It doesn't have that physicality to it. So you can see, because Bradbury chose pleasure, even though most of those other words get across a general sense of it being positive, each one carries with it a characteristic, a series of connotative meanings, a, a sequence of associations that add depth to the language. And I know I sort of harp on about this quite a lot, but this is why when people say the prose doesn't matter, it, it comes across as not paying attention to how stories are being told, how authors are actually evoking these things, how they build out extended metaphors, how they build out and construct atmosphere and feeling and subtext. And all of that is done through the careful selection of words. So if we go back to the main paragraph, we can see, I've just highlighted a couple of bits and pieces here. I'm not going to do a complete breakdown of every single thing here, but this is up on the screen. You can pause this and actually read through it and start thinking about a couple of the points that I'm going to raise here. So it was a pleasure to burn. We have it then repeated. It was a special pleasure. So it is a repetition. And again, you know, the rules of writing say don't repeat things. Don't, you shouldn't be repetitive. But repetition brings with it certain effects when used very deliberately. You don't want to be repetitive in the sense of you only seem to know one word for something and you just keep using that same word over and over again. That becomes boring. But it was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure. So there is repetition, but it has been slightly altered to elevate it. And what is this? It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. So here we have pleasure to burn now being linked to being consumed physically by an animal. This is what I was talking about in terms of this word pleasure having these bodily connections to see things blackened and changed. So blackened and changed linking back to burning. So it's about consuming, consummation. With the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head. In the modern day, when people talk about 
transparent prose and clean prose and window prose. And they have all of these different ways of trying to get across, make it as transparent as possible. So you're just giving the, the reader what is happening. This is the antithesis of that. This is going to, you know, that whole thing where people say, oh, it's purple prose, it's overwritten, it's too descriptive. And yet it is because of the color of this language that we are getting the vibrancy of what is going on. If we were going to do this with sort of bland, straightforward, transparent prose, he turned on the flamethrower and set fire to the house. Oh, wow. Knock my socks off with that amazing story. It's not just enough to tell you what is happening. Sometimes it's about how you are being told what is happening that becomes really important. And here we have if you go through this paragraph, look for the slightly sexual innuendos being played with, the, the double entendre or the slightly suggestive turns of phrase. Then look at it in terms of bodily function and this idea of eating, spitting, pounding, gorging, this excessive gluttony, again, a very physical sense that is being evoked. And then think of the different textures that we have here, the brass nozzle. Then we have venomous kerosene, charcoal ruins of history, the gorging fire that turned the evening sky red and yellow and black. So this fire, how is fire turning the sky black? Of course, it's the smoke, the oily smoke of the kerosene as it is burning all of these things, this black oily smoke is going up, but he doesn't mention the smoke because the point of view character is focused so much on the flame and what the flame is doing. And then we have these really nice turns of phrase. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. Not he walked forward while the embers lifted around him, which would be bland and prosaic. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. This is evocative. While the flapping pigeon winged books died on the porch. Look at all of the personification that is going on here. The flame is a living thing. The, the flamethrower itself as a creature that this is about consuming and eating and the killing of the flapping pigeon winged books. These books are things in and of themselves. They are living creatures. But what's actually being evoked is this violent burning that is causing the books to lift up on the heat and the pages burn out and the flapping of pages and the flapping of the covers. We can imagine it. It is evocative. And so when people say that you must use a certain type of prose, this is the thing that I always want to push back against. Prose should be appropriate to the style and narrative that you're telling. And there, there may be certain styles that at present are in vogue. There may be certain styles that are no longer in vogue, but that doesn't mean that they can't be in vogue again, or you can't learn from them and use them. And how evocative and poetic and imagery laden and sensory, full of information that this simple paragraph is, because all this is, is a guy standing there with a flamethrower setting fire to a house. That's it. That's all that is happening. And you can think of all of the different ways to tell that. And yet this is what Bradbury chose, the allure of it. You can see why this is getting into the mind of an arsonist, the mind of someone obsessed with how flames actually consume the material. I don't know if you ever had this when you were a child, but sitting staring at the fire and watching the, the flames dance along the coals and slowly the, the coals turning that bright cherry red, some of them going almost white and the flames dancing above them, that there's something mesmerizing about that. And we have that aspect of it, this, this point of view character being mesmerized by this sight, but added to it 
is a very sexual undertone. This very physical pleasure that he is getting from this act. And it is an act that is consuming. It is an act that is eating. It is an act that is very physically rooted, very much rooted in a bodily experience. And that's why pleasure is such an important word for the opening, rather than, oh, it was wonderful. Oh, it was delightful. Oh, isn't it so nice? Even something, oh, it was exquisite. Exquisite could kind of work, but you can see that pleasure actually fits better. It's not that exquisite doesn't fit at all, or you couldn't use any of the other words, but sometimes something just fits better. And that is why prose matters. So again, this as an opening, you could say that this is arresting because, oh, it's someone burning books. It's not the greatest hook in the world. The hook here is that the person doing the book burning is obsessed with it, is deriving a sexual pleasure from it. And that is a fascinating insight into a way of thinking and experiencing something that just doesn't make sense to us. And that is part of what literature can do. It can transport us into a new way of perceiving something. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I'll see you in the next one.